Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Katie Lloyd Thomas, and I'm one of the uh, people that organises the Public Lecture Series, uh, which is organised by um, the School of Architecture, Planning uh, and uh, Landscape. And I was saying to say before the lecture that it's a public lecture series, it's free uh, to the university community and obviously to people beyond the university. And I think today we've got quite an interesting spread in the audience. So thank you very much for coming to uh, listen and welcome uh, uh, Saif El Rashidi. Um, I'm going to say this right at the beginning, which is that we have a next lecture. So this series is ongoing. There's one in May from Lyas Afeel. But the very next one is the 16th of April. And that's Ole B. Jensen, who's uh, joining us from Aalborg University in Denmark. And the uh, theme of his lecture is Mobilities Design towards a mobile material turn. So hopefully we'll see some of you um, at that as well. So we're really pleased to welcome uh, Saif Al-Rashidi uh, this evening. Uh, we often have uh, academics and writers uh, lecturing as part of this series. But tonight it's really nice to have a practitioner, um, albeit also a very learned one who's published and taught uh, in heritage management studies and in history of art. Uh, as well. And he's going to bring to us a perspective on world heritage uh, listing and what it means uh, for the cities that get it, but uh, from the inside, uh, from the perspective of somebody who's uh, run uh, world heritage uh, sites. Um, and I suppose I wanted to say also, uh, in, in some cases, uh, the cities that don't uh, get listing or withdraw draw their applications, uh, as happened here uh, with the Weirmouth uh, Jarrow World Heritage Grid. SAFE is an international cultural preservation specialist, and in 2014, he was appointed the Magna Carta Program Manager at, Sol at Salisbury Cathedral. So he's taking responsibility for the delivery of the cathedral's uh, program of events and activities throughout 2015, which celebrates Magna Carta's 800th anniversary. And um, he's just told me today as well that in fact the opening of this exhibition is to, tomorrow night. So I'm sort of like, I'm amazed that you've come to join us, flown in especially for this this evening. So that's going to be opened by Neil McGregor uh, tomorrow evening. So good, good luck with that. Um, um, interestingly, and particularly maybe for architecture students uh, that are here, um, Safe studied and worked in architecture. Uh, as well as complete, uh, completing an MSc in City Design and Social Science uh, as part of the Cities Programme at uh, LSE. Um, and his talk tonight is going to draw on the experiences and knowledge um, from 10 years working as a senior planner and architectural historian in Cairo for the Aga Khan Historic Cities Programme. His work there included surveying, setting up a museum, and making a conservation plan for 500 historic buildings in Cairo with a view also to improving the quality of urban life. So that's now one of the World Heritage uh, listed sites. We're going to hear a lot more about that this evening. But I met Saif uh, when he'd already moved from that uh, medieval environment uh, to coordinate the Durham uh, World Heritage Site. A job he took on uh, with relish, organizing uh, the new prize-winning floodlighting at the building, which I enjoy whenever I well, I will enjoy it tonight, I think, when I pass it in the train. Um, but also setting up the Durham Gateway Visitor Centre uh, with particularly an aim to increase diversity of visitors and to work with local artists uh, and performers and also uh, to bring in students. And uh, he, we took stage one students uh, to Durham and, uh, and many of them chose to, work, uh, to write their history essay, actually, about World Heritage Listing having sort of listened to some of the issues that he's brought up. So we're really delighted that he's uh, agreed to bring this expertise, this research, and this nuanced understanding of what World Heritage Listing actually means on a practical level. How does an international um, distinction have a bearing on national preservation systems, if at all? And what does World Heritage status mean for the cities? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming, and it's very nice to see some former colleagues and friends from Durham. Um, and I thought I'd start with this image and ask you a question. How many of you think this is Cairo, and how many of you think this might be Cairo? Well, it's not Durham. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could be Durham Prison. 
Okay, well, actually, it's neither the Durham nor Cairo, um, but it is a World Heritage Site, and this is Robben Island in South Africa, and I thought it would be an interesting one, an interesting image to start with, given that we tend to think of World Heritage Sites as beautiful places, and many of them are, but not all of them are, um, and, and I think, I mean, the thing about World Heritage Sites is that they have to be of outstanding universal value, um, and outstanding universal value isn't always a beautiful cathedral or a medieval city or um, a beautiful modern city either. It can sometimes be something that's as symbolic as a prison where uh, for many decades people were kept, political prisoners were kept. And, and in fact, Robben Island is a world heritage site because it's come to symbolize the triumph of justice and the struggle for freedom and equality um, over injustice. Um, but I think, had I shown you this at the beginning, most people wouldn't have been surprised to find that the Taj Mahal is a world heritage site. And more of them, um, of the thousand, maybe there are around 800 around the world, I would say that more of them are in this category than in the Robben Island category. Um, not, I know this is the School of Architecture, but not all world heritage sites are built <coughs> sites. Um, there are also natural sites like the Great Barrier Reef, um, and there are cultural landscapes which are the combination of nature and um, man-made interventions, <coughs> built environments. Um, one of the things which is interesting about the World Heritage List is that sometimes you find places on the list that you expect to be there and other times there are places that aren't on the list even though um, they're great places in terms of heritage and heritage value. This is Bath. Uh, which is on the World Heritage List. Um, and I'm sure many of you, including Martin Lowe in the room, will of course re recognize York, um, which um, for, for many reasons one would expect to be on the World Heritage List, but it's not. Um, and I think one of the interesting things about York is that um, it's, it's been close to being on the World Heritage List several times. I remember the last time, I think, um, York was advised that there were too many medieval cathedral cities in Europe on the World Heritage List and um, that it should focus on other things in its, in its bid to, be, to, be, to, become on the list, to be put on the list and that one of the good things about York was the many layers of archaeology and that that would be an important thing to focus on. And then when this bid was submitted, um, the feedback was that there wasn't enough focus on the medieval cathedral. <laughs> um, so I think there's an element, I mean, I don't think that the, the list is entirely objective in what gets on it and what, what isn't on it. There's also um, I mean, a changing understanding of what World Heritage is. And I think it's, it's moved from the idea of monumental and grand buildings and cities to being also vernacular and small scale and more modern things. And I think that in a way York's a bit unlucky because it probably could have got on the list and, I know the 80s or the 70s when Durham did, um, but today it's in competition um, with many other <coughs> slightly similar places on the list. And also there's been an increasing focus on, on putting other types of heritage on the list and a medieval city as great as York. Um, things on the places on the list tend to stay on it, but there are a few exceptions. Two exceptions. This is Dresden in Germany. Um, which was listed in the early 2000s, I think 2004, 2005, um, as a cultural landscape, and was delisted uh, five years later uh, because of the construction of this um, uh, la rather large bridge. Um, this is the, a trial period when the bridge was new, but before they opened it to traffic, and pedestrians were allowed to just walk across it. And so I imagine that it was popular to a large extent, given the number of people um, on the bridge in this photo. But there's often this challenge, I think, with, with cities is <coughs> what's more important, to stay on the World Heritage List or to, to meet some modern infrastructure needs. And the thing about the World Heritage distinction is that it's a mark of honor, a badge of honor, but in fact, um, the most UNESCO can do is take a site off the list or send a mission and, and give advice, but, but in it's, I think in this case, in the case of Germany, it was a bit embarrassing for a site um, in a European country to be taken off the list for not abiding by um, principles that UNESCO advised. 
um, but it's an interesting example. Um, the other example is this one, the Arabian Oryx Sanctuary in Oman, which was also taken off the list because um, one of the things that a state or a nation has to do when it, when, for a site to be on the list is make sure that it's safeguarded. And if uh, the state party, as it's called, is not seen to be doing that, um, it can risk World Heritage Site status being taken away. And in this case, poaching was a problem and there didn't seem to be enough happening to protect it and to prevent it. Um, big sections of the sanctuary were, were not were kind of removed from sanctuary status and so uh, this is the, the second site that lost its World Heritage status about 10 years ago. Well now let's focus on the two sites which I'm here to talk about, Durham and Cairo. Met very different in some respects, uh, similar in terms of some challenges. Um, and I thought, I mean, UNESCO today has 10 criteria for um, why a place can be on the World Heritage List. Um, in some cases, like Cairo and probably Durham, um, these are criteria that post-date these sites being on the World Heritage List. And, and in fact, when you look at um, why Durham's on the list, if, if, you, if you apply for World Heritage status today and you are developing a file for Durham, you'd probably emphasize different things, or you'd emphasize additional things, I would say, which aren't mentioned at all, um, or weren't mentioned at all in the 80s when, when Durham was put on the list. Um, yes, I mean, Durham Cathedral is a great Norman building, of course, but there's no mention of the political significance of the castle and the cathedral together, um, of the prince bishops, of, of many other things which today um, we talk about a lot, or a lot more, I would say. Um, and Catherine Dewar from English Heritage was just telling me how wonderful the Norman Chapel in the cathedral, in the castle is. For those who haven't seen it, it is indeed wonderful and this is what it looks like. Um, it's specifically mentioned as one of the reasons that um, <coughs> Durham is an excellent example of Norman architecture. Um, and in a way it's, it's strange that this is the only bit of the castle that's mentioned in the listing. Um, was the castle itself has a very long history and a, and a great history of occupation by the Prince Bishops of modification and, and perhaps today had Jane, my successor, been proposing it for World Heritage status, that would be one of the things that um, I'm sure she would talk about more than the 1980s documentation does. Um, here is, I mean, one of the key reasons that Durham is on the World Heritage list um, that it's a milestone, a very important transition in architecture, uh, thanks to the use of the pointed arch, which paves the way for Gothic architecture. Um, I've summarized these statements, by the way. The, 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 the whole statements are much longer and more convoluted, but I thought, for your purposes, um, I'd just give you the summary of um, why, how Dara meets three of the criteria uh, to be a World Heritage Site. Um, yeah, of course, one of the great things about Durham is that, um, like many historic sites, it's a living site, it has living traditions. And this is the banner of St. Cuthbert, um, and traditionally the community of St. Cuthbert had a banner which, um, which they made after the Battle of Neville's Cross in the 14th century, um, and embroidered some, relic, some of St. Cuthbert's relics into, um, and it, the banner would be taken by the monastic community um, on important occasions, not only celebrations, but also when they needed St. Cuthbert to help them, for example, in battle, battle or when there was a problem. Um, <coughs> there's a very nice story of the castle, of a fire in the city, um, moving towards the castle, and the monks running out of the cathedral quickly, taking St. Cuthbert's banner and rushing towards the castle to make sure that St. Cuthbert's blessings would uh, protect the castle from fire. So, the banner was actually thrown in the fire after the Reformation by a zealous uh, dean's wife who was very Protestant um, and felt it was sacrilegious to believe in such things. And it was a replica was made a few years ago and here it is um, in procession in the city of Durham. Um, and I think definitely one of the things that makes Durham valuable, I mean, the UNESCO listing mentions the evangelizing of Northumbria and the memories of Benedictine life, but there are many other living traditions um, hundreds of traditions, I would say, that, that make Durham particularly noteworthy. And for example, today one might think of mining traditions and how those relate to the life of the cathedral. 
Cairo. Um, the one thing that you can't see in an image is noise. And, and I think it's very hard to, to kind of really get the flavor of Cairo without thinking of um, it as a bustling, noisy city. So I chose the best image I could find. It's also a city that never seems to sleep. Um, and so a nighttime image I thought was appropriate. I think Cairo is an amazing example of a World Heritage Site because it's great in many ways, but everything's wrong with it um, in terms of heritage and heritage preservation. And, and so I chose um, to start with this criterion first, a significant traditional human settlement that's vulnerable under socio cultural or economic change. And I think that's a very good represent representation of Cairo. All the minarets you see piercing the skyline date, I would say, probably from the 13th to the 16th centuries. Um, there, are, there are lots of other buildings in the middle. And I think that's one of the challenges of Cairo, that it has many great medieval buildings and post-medieval buildings and many dreadful modern buildings too. Um, <coughs> And in a way, it makes you rethink or think critically of um, how something can have so many modern interventions that are incompatible with the historic character and still be a World Heritage Site and still be on the list. Um, another criterion is that it has numerous great monuments, mainly from or mainly representing Islamic civilization of different periods. This is a 9th century mosque of Ibn Tulum. Um, this is a detail of a stone dome from the 15th century. Um, and for those of you interested in geometry, um, it's a pretty difficult task to have this geometric pattern on a curved surface and make it work. Um, and the other thing is, I mean, it's the same criteria as Durham, or criterion as Durham, that um, it's a living site and it's witness to um, all these traditions that have passed through it um, and continue to shape it. And I thought that this image on the left was a nice image simply because we look at the scale of the door, um, and I think that tells you a lot about the wealth of the city in, in medieval times. Um, this is a dome, actually, the tile work at the bottom is made by craftsmen that were commissioned and came from Tabriz in Iran. Um, and I think one of the great, I mean, often with great cities, what you find is that the level of patronage is so high that you can import craftsmen that you like from all over the world. Um, and this mosque is a good example. It's from the 14th century, and it was one sultan in Egypt who liked tile work and decided that he wanted it on his buildings, hired a group of craftsmen who came and worked for a few years and went back to Iran, and, and it's a brief burst of tile work that never appears again. Um, and the retrospective UNESCO documentation produced two years ago on why Cairo, or basically the statement of outstanding universal value for Cairo, Mention, specifically mentions this mosque um, founded in the 10th century and became a university in 989, uh, Al Azhar University, which still functions, still operates today. Many of the university buildings are now modern buildings, partially around the mosque itself, but partially on a, in a new campus. But I mean, one of the striking things is that it's still a university over a thousand years <coughs> later. And if you look. Um, I would say that these are probably people studying the Quran, but traditionally this is how people would have used the mosque. A tutor would have gathered his students around the column and explained um, initially theology, but um, also sciences and things like that. And with time, <coughs> the mosque became, I mean, the university expanded and became like any other university, and moved from theological origins to the study of everything else too. Um, I thought this image of a shrine was an interesting one. Um, this is the shrine of Muhammad's grandson in, in Cairo. Um, and you can, see you can see people venerating the shrine um, and the continuation of religious tradition and, and worship. The reason I chose it is that I imagine that the shrine of St. Cuthbert in Durham Cathedral would have looked similar to this um, before the Reformation and would have been, um, people would have interacted with it in the same way. Um, we know that it was a very lavish shrine, and it, had, it was supposed to be the wealthiest shrine in England. Um, so it would have looked something like this, and I imagine that had you come here in the 14th century, come to Durham in the 14th century, you'd get all, all these people coming to the shrine and praying and hoping that St. Cuthbert would solve some of their problems. 
Um, now I'm going to focus a bit more on management. And one of the big contrasts between Cairo and Durham is land ownership. A very simple thing, but I think one of the, the things that makes Durham a remarkable World Heritage Site is that essentially it has two owners, Durham Cathedral and Durham University, both um, well-educated, well-established, relatively wealthy organizations. I mean, not rolling in money, but, but I think with enough knowledge and know-how and experience um, to safeguard their site. And also, um, two institutions that work have a tradition and a history of working very closely together. The university was founded by the cathedral. Um, and so all of these affect the management of the site. When you have a small number of people making decisions, they know each other well, they work together, um, it makes it a lot easier. Cairo, on the other hand, um, buildings probably half the size of this room could have about 10 owners, for example, because um, inheritance, I mean, a property is passed down from one generation to the next, and every time a generation inherits it, there are more people. And so it's very difficult to do things with property. Um, when you have loads of heirs who own small shares, and what invariably happens in Cairo is that a few people occupy a family-owned property, and so the people that own it but don't occupy it think, well, actually, we don't care what happens to it because we don't live in it and we don't benefit from it. And if it collapses, we're probably better off because we can sell the land and get some of our money. So, I mean, that, that has a very strong bearing on, on the difficulty of dealing with things in Cairo, that, that land ownership is extremely complex. Sometimes it actually preserves buildings because people can't do anything with them. Um, so it preserves the physical fabric badly. Um, <clears throat> and I chose this example of a building I actually worked on with the organization I worked for converting from a derelict old building to a community center and it took us about three years to buy the property simply because it had about 20 owners um, and the only way we could our company could acquire it was that one of the owners had to go around to all his relatives and get their permission and get them to agree uh, for a fee. I mean, we had to pay him to kind of go on this wild goose chase around Egypt trying to find all his relatives who had a share in the building. Um, but I, I think, say, 85 or 95 percent of historic Cairo World Heritage Site is in private hands. The monumental buildings aren't, and that's the difference. That. The government owns all the most important buildings. So, for example, this is the city wall built in the 12th century. Everything else is owned by private individuals, most of whom have little interest in heritage um, and have inherited these buildings but don't particularly care about their fate or their history. Um, one very striking contrast between Cairo and Egypt in general and the UK is the concept of listing. <coughs> And I hope my colleagues at English Heritage, my friends from English Heritage, will be happy that I, th I think that the UK idea of listing is a much more sensitive and thoughtful and nuanced one. Whereas in Egypt, there, there's only one, either something's listed or it isn't. Um, and as a result, um, I, I thought this set of, or this pair of photos showing the same view in the 19th century and in our century um, is quite interesting because. The monumental building which has been listed from the 19th century still survives. Everything else has disappeared. And I think the problem with many cities, and Cairo is certainly one of them, is that the idea that normal, everyday buildings can be valuable is something that's lost on many people. It's only when they start to become rare that um, people start to think they're, they're important. And actually, I remember going with, with you, Martin, to a rural site outside Durham to look at a farm building. Um, and I was very surprised because it was a modern farm building and I thought, well, why is this a listed building? And I, I, Martin explained to me that actually it follows historic um, land, division of land, and, and kind of it isn't only the physical fabric, but also property demarcations, etc. I think that level of sensitivity is very far from the kind of things with, that we deal with in, in Egypt. Um, so buildings like this, for example, on, Bain, on, on the Bailey in Durham, are uh, listed buildings, protected and preserved. And, and I think that 
that's really what preserves historic cities. It isn't just the greatest buildings, but the sense of being in a city with a lot of history and um, the urban fabric, the streets, and just the everyday buildings that people built to live in. Um, this is a plan that was put in place in Cairo in 1967. Um, and obviously its focus wasn't really on the historic city. All the, the yellow buildings or listed buildings, um, this is, a, I would say, probably half of, of the historic Cairo World Heritage Site. Um, and this plan, I mean, in order to improve traffic circulation in the city at large, proposed to cut through the historic city. Um, thankfully, it was never fully implemented, but it was never cancelled either. And so, periodically, uh, one would find that I know, different arms of it, the municipality would think, oh, well, the street's narrow, let's widen it, and then resort to this plan to, to kind of um, guide them. So this is one example. And if you look closely at the buildings in this image, most of them are late 19th century buildings, which were actually very valuable. Um, the interesting and sad thing about this project is that the authority that decided to do it, to create this new road, ran out of money. And so the only thing they did is they demolished the buildings to create this new street and then found that they didn't have the money to, to work through it. So I'm sure for those of you working in heritage in England, you probably think, well, actually, life could be so much worse. Um, but I think also to be unfair to simply use Cairo as the bad example and not think about things in Durham. And one of the things upon reflection uh, which I felt about Durham in the time that I, I was there, is that the demise of the city council, in my opinion, uh, led, to, um, the, 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 or, or led to the loss of a team of people who were dedicated every day thinking about the city and its heritage issues, who were subsumed into a larger team thinking about the heritage issues in the whole county. And, and I think that once you have when, when you have a responsibility for a huge area, it's much it's a much bigger ask to, to, to monitor every little thing that happens in the city. And so things like these signs, for example, which popped up on a restaurant in Durham, I imagine would have been much harder. Uh, I mean, they probably wouldn't have, have been approved at the time when the city council still had a dedicated um, design and conservation team monitoring everything. Many, two of them in this room, so I hope you agree with me. But it's something that, that I definitely think having a dedicated task force of people that know the city inside out makes a very big difference. Um, I mean, the extreme of that is in Cairo of um, what's happening or what's happened in the past few years in terms of uncontrolled urban development. So all of the buildings that you see, basically all of these buildings were built since the revolution in 2011. And I mean, if Durham's challenge is perhaps that there isn't a city council anymore and, and, and a team of people focusing only on the city, Cairo's challenge is that in the, from 2011, well, I, I would say from 2011 to 2013, perhaps, um, you could get away with anything because there was no municipal control. Um, and in a system with a tendency, or with enough corrupt people to turn a blind eye, um, this is what happened. And actually, I'm, I'm quite regretful in a way because I worked on the project to convert what was a dump site into this lovely park and we restored the city wall. Um, and we never dreamt that actually planning authorities would disappear for a few years and what would happen is that everyone thought, well, if we build an eight-story apartment block, what we'll get is a lovely view of this park. And that's what people did. So sometimes projects with the best intentions in the world can have um, the worst impact. Um, yeah, this is the 14th century mosque. I showed, I showed you the dome of this mosque. And interestingly, one of, the, one of the policies that was most strongly adhered to in Cairo was that you should never build around a listed building or a listed monument. That, I mean, it was a policy developed to protect the <coughs> pharaonic buildings and temples which had been encroached upon and was applied to medieval buildings. In a way, it didn't really make much sense because Cairo has always been a dense urban environment. But actually, what astonished me and dismayed me is that municipal control had to disappear to the extent that the Antiquities Department, uh, which was always very zealous and very good at making sure that nothing was ever built close to one of their 600 listed buildings, 
um, allowed this to, to be constructed. And here it is the following year with a new building alongside it as well. Um, this is probably a late 19th century building and when I worked in Cairo in the, from the late 90s to 2008, most of this area would have had buildings very similar to this and there were none of these. So this is all in the past few years. Um, yeah, I think the issue of management also is very strongly linked to the idea of reuse and that the reuse of buildings helps them to survive. Um, Durham Castle is a very good example. Uh, this is one of the recently refurbished bedrooms in the castle. Um, and, and I think that one of the good things about Durham Castle is that it's used by, it isn't a stately home, it isn't a museum that people visit, the students actually live in it. Um, it's also a bed and breakfast um, during the holidays, um, which I think means that um, it's maintained to a large extent. I think that um, using buildings is often a good way of making sure they survive. Um, sometimes um, there are compromises that are made in terms of you know, what finishing materials and the like, but, but overall, I mean, historic builds, buildings that are in use tend to fare better than those that are just <coughs> um, And This is the great hall of the castle during a formal dinner and also informally. And I think it's an, I mean, I think the informality of the use of a building like as great as Durham Castle is one of its remarkable aspects. <coughs> Um, Egypt also has a, a strong tradition of building reuse, but it's, it's rare, I would say, I mean, it's much less likely for, you, for one to find um, a thousand-year-old building used by 18-year-old students. Um, and ma many, I was looking at the UNESCO reports on Cairo um, and what their recommendations had been in the past few years, and one of the recommendations was that they should encourage the reuse of historic buildings for things other than cultural activities like performance and dance and, and actually the, no matter how big a city is and Cairo is pretty big um, there's only a certain number of cultural centers that you can have that are viable and, and you have to think of other uses that are sometimes less glamorous but um, more practical um, yeah new new development I thought I mean well obviously I've shown you numerous examples of new development in Cairo and I think that uh, for those architects right amongst them uh, in this room, I mean, it's an important thing to think about of new development in the context of a historic city. Um, this is a view of the citadel of Cairo, which was built from the 12th century onwards. Um, the mosque in the middle is from the 19th century. This one is from the early 14th century, and many of the walls are older. Um, and a very wealthy developer had a piece of land right next to it and decided that what he really wanted to do was build a commercial center um, on his piece of land. And I remember talking to the, the, the planner in charge in the Cairo governorate and she said, oh, well, you know, I, I know his sister and he's dreamt of building this lovely project for 20 years and it will have such a wonderful view. And I mean, this, this I mean, it almost went ahead. Luckily, UNESCO intervened um, and I mean, they managed to, to get the, the, the local authorities in Egypt to make sure that um, the building heights were limited and that um, it would have a, uh, I mean, to, weaken, to lessen the impact of the project on this amazing historic complex that I showed you. Um, but actually, one of the interesting things is that the municipal authorities in Egypt were more concerned by the traffic problems that this would cause than they were by the fact that it was going to encroach um, on this extremely important um, complex. But I thought this was interesting. This is from the website of the developer. Um, and this is the view that they would get from the development. And he says that it's responsibly designed in partnership with UNESCO. Actually, it wasn't. It was um, that they were forced by UNESCO to, to kind of control what they were doing and rethink the, the scheme. Um, and this is what it, I think it's going to look like. Um, it's submerged to some extent, but, but still, I mean, it, I think it's thought-provoking that this is the kind of thing that can go on in a World Heritage Site um, and almost go through. Um, and this was probably an attempt to make it appeal more to those with an interest in history by making the buildings look somewhat more historic, the new buildings look somewhat more historic. Um, this is its 
state today. Um, so this is about this is the street level. So it's much luckily much lower than what you originally intended. Um, but still, I think it's somehow you think why can't heritage have, be valued more highly than this in a city like Cairo? Um, now we turn to Durham, and I thought I. When I went for my job interview in Durham, actually, one of the things that struck me was this building, especially the green bit. Um, and I asked the people interviewing me about why they had allowed this green building to, to appear in the center of Durham. And I think it probably helped me get the job. Um, but, but I've had many informal discussions with um, one of the experts on Durham, Martin Roberts, who, who, had a, who was the conservation officer for a long time and said that actually it was an, an interesting project to work on because the challenge was to get the developer to break the volume up into smaller fragment sections so that even though it's a huge building, it looks like several buildings built alongside each other. But this is something that, that I mean, I think it's a striking project because it's huge, it's very large in scale, and this is the castle here, so it's on the boundaries of the World Heritage Site. Um, and, I, and I think, I mean, I personally think that there could have been um, a better solution than this one. Um, and, and so I think that one would assume that in a World Heritage Site like Durham, um, you never have to worry about these things, but actually sometimes big schemes go ahead and, and in very sensitive locations as well. And here's another view of it. So I, I think that, that actually the efforts to break the, the mass down into smaller sections, I mean, you can see that what's taken place, but, but I still think I still wonder whether this is the best solution. Um, I'm going to talk about a project which I was more, or many people in this room were involved in, which is um, a project to redevelop um, this site here, which is in the boundaries of the World Heritage Site on South Bailey. Um, and, and the idea was to, to redevelop this site with a 1920s house, um, which wasn't particularly in keeping with the rest of the urban fabric, which is much more urban in feeling. Um, and this is one, I, I intentionally chose an early version of the design so that um, I'm not criti criti critiquing something current. But this was one of the early versions of the design, this is an early version of the design proposed for this site. Um, and my view, as well as the World Heritage Committee in Durham and many people, well, the people I know in this room was that actually, um, was the new design any more appropriate than the whole building being proposed for demolition? And, and I think that, I mean, we had many discussions with the architect, and it was actually quite, uh, many of those discussions were quite tense about what was appropriate and, and whether we were correct in, in trying to stifle an architect's creativity. And I think sometimes, yeah, I mean, my personal view is that I mean, modern architecture is, can be great, but on the other hand, with a site as sensitive as this and as well preserved as this, um, I, I personally think, and many of my colleagues on the World Heritage Committee agreed, that the heritage value of Durham um, should take precedence over an architect's desire to build the building that he, he wanted to build. Um, so hopefully, I mean, actually things have moved on since then, and I'm sure that whatever is built will, will be more sympathetic than, than this scheme, thanks to um, many of the English heritage colleagues and my successor in Durham who are in the room. Um, and I think it's important because if you let people build exactly what they want to build, sometimes their imaginations run wild. Um, this is a building in historic Cairo. Actually, this is the street that I showed you where they just cut through five or six buildings and created a new street. Um, and this is, I think, what you get when people in conservation departments don't really pay enough attention to what architectural traditions are and think, oh, actually, it looks historic, it has columns and de decorative elements, um, and so it's not too bad. And I think one of, that's my experience of working in Cairo is that as long as you presented a building that looked somehow decorative um, and had historic elements, no matter what century or culture they were from, um, <laughs> you would get permission. Um, yeah, I mean, I think a key site in Durham which, um, which um, is worth thinking about is this one. This site is currently being, well, probably half of it's been developed and the other half is in the process. 
but it's this one, Milburn Gate House, which is a huge site on the river. Um, and I mean, anything that's developed there would have a significant impact on the World Heritage Site in Durham. I mean, bearing in mind that one of the key aspects of make, what makes Durham what it is, is the view of it and the view from it. Um, and I mean, it's hard to miss all of you who live in Newcastle and ever take the train. I mean, I'm sure that the one image you have of Durham is the view of the Cathedral and Castle. And, and I think that um, the difficulty of this site is that it's a huge piece of land um, and it's very difficult to build something without having an impact. And, and, and it will be interesting to, to see what the outcome of the redevelopment plan for this site will be. Hopefully a good one. Um, another kind of ongoing project in Durham is the project to build a new bus station. And um, in fact, one of the things that I worked on before, just before leaving Durham was um, looking at the views. I mean, the, the, the initial schemes or the initial drawings of this scheme <coughs> didn't show that you could see the, the cathedral very well from the site. And um, in fact, it might be a very good opportunity to have a bus station with the best view in the world. But um, whether that will take place or not, one, one wonders. Um, the other thing is, it raises the question of whether every bus station has to look the same or whether the, there could be a design that's more appropriate for a city like Durham. And, and I think the other thing which is interesting from an architectural point of view is how long are new buildings planned to last? Um, buildings like the cathedral were planned to last for thousands of years. Um, I was having a discussion with someone at Durham University a couple of years ago about the demolition and replacement um, of a 1960s building on the World Heritage Site. And I said, oh, well, I mean, isn't there a way you can remodel it rather than demolish it in the 60s? I mean, it's not really that old. And he said, no, 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 it's much, it's much more economical to demolish it. And so I said, well, perhaps then if you build a new building, what you should do is build one that um, people won't want to demolish in 40 years. And he said, no, actually, uh, according to project management and what we do today, 30 or 40 years is a very good lifespan for a building, and after that you should demolish it. So I think that, that perhaps, I mean, it's hard for a World Heritage Committee to, to argue the case for a building, that, a bus station that will last 200 years, but it might be a different and more rewarding way of thinking of new interventions in a historic city, is to build things that three generations from now, we still think, well, we're happy that this building survives. Um, the city of Durham Trust, some of you in this room will smile. Um, and I think, having worked in Cairo and Durham, one of the things that struck me as valuable is having organizations like trusts. Because, um, in a way, they, they have strong opinions on heritage and they're not, they're not afraid to state those opinions no matter what the cost is. I mean, obviously, with, with any dialogue between people who want to develop and people who, who don't, um, there are many issues at stake and kind of, oh, this institution's important, so we should help it a bit, or kind of listen to what it says. But I think organizations like the City of Durham Trust tend not to care what other people think, and they just state the case very, very explicitly. Um, yes, I'm sure that many people that have dealt with trusts like the City of Durham Trust may think, oh, why do they have to kind of nitpick on every piece of slate and granite, and can't they just turn a blind eye at times? But I think that in the grand scheme of things, um, it's good to have lobbies that act as watchdogs and raise a red flag when they think that something's going wrong. Because it, it leads to debate and discussion and, and, and I think that in the long run that's, that's good for the preservation of the city. And a city like Cairo, I think one of the things which it lacks most um, is local groups with enough clout to actually stop a government, the government from saying, well, we, we build a new road or we do this or we do that. Um, so these kind of citizen groups can sometimes seem annoying, but I think that they're actually quite valuable. Management plans. <laughs> um, one of the hard things about World Heritage Sites and being a World Heritage Site coordinator is that um, you're given the responsibility of developing and implementing a management plan, um, which even with the best will in the world, tend to be longer documents than one would hope. Um, and I chose this one, the old one for Durham, because 
There were many things that we did do, but there were also things which are kind of number 25 on the long table of things that are supposed to take place, um, which you don't always get around to doing. The other thing is that most people in charge of heritage are quite busy implementing things, and, and referring to a management plan isn't the kind of thing you do every day. Um, but UNESCO uh, requires World Heritage Sites to have them, and the process of developing, one, developing them, I think, is a valuable process because it brings people who think about conservation, intangible heritage, maintenance, history, all of that together, um, and um, the kind of in, 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 the, in a dialogue about um, what needs to be done in three or five years. Um, but management plans are hard to implement, um, and one of the things about a World Heritage Site, or most World Heritage Sites, is that um, there are many entities responsible for the management and implementation of various aspects of them. Um, and even though Durham, I would say, is straightforward in some respects that it has two owners, it's, it's still complicated to make sure that everything fits in together perfectly. Um, I thought, given that much of my presentation has been critical and a bit bleak, um, I should end with some good things. Um, and I think that there have been very good interventions and very good projects um, in both Cairo and Durham. Um, and um, this is one um, which I had nothing to do with in the time that I was there, but I think it's an excellent project. The conversion of the former treasures exhibit in Durham Cathedral to a new shop. Um, it's very sensitively done by Purcell architects, who I think had a very good understanding of the history of this space and, and how, to, how to unify a space that had been divided into a treasures exhibition and a restaurant. Um, and I think that, I mean, I think one of the things about it is that this, also the materials used are very good. There's very, a great deal of attention paid to detail, which isn't always the case with institutionally owned heritage, I would have to say, that often the best interventions are those where one person has a strong vision and good knowledge and, and implements it. Um, and I think that in this case, the firm of architects and the lead architect, Chris Cotton, had that and, and it's produced very good results. Um, sometimes, I mean, I think with, with large organizations, you also have to deal with procurement policy and all sorts of things, which tends to filter out talented but small enterprises. Um, who sometimes can do a great job but just won't look as good when they're competing with a firm that's done a hundred projects in like, five different cities. Um, and Cairo too has had, um, other than the area I showed you with all the kind of new buildings popping up, um, the, the more tourist, or the, the, mo the more kind of touristy bit of historic Cairo um, where most of the most where most of the greatest monuments are, has always received government attention and government intervention and a very large investment over the past 20 years in improving the infrastructure and restoring many of the buildings. And I think one of the greatest successes of this project is that um, it made the area appealing enough to attract Egyptians to come to, to come to these buildings and to enjoy them too, and that it wasn't only the preserve of tourists coming to spend an hour or two. Um, and the historic city, even though land prices are very high, tends to be occupied by, I mean, most of the residents aren't particularly wealthy. And I think that one of the best things about this project is that it's created attractive public spaces and that many of the people, well, a combination of people from other neighborhoods of the city using those spaces and local residents um, has been observed. And I think that's a great thing that it's been a project that's benefited um, local residents as well as um, tourist groups and much more, much more wealthy segments, much wealthier segments of society. Um, and I think obviously um, one of the most obvious things about heritage is that if you want people to preserve it and to care for it, um, they should feel that it somehow belongs to them and that they benefit from it. And I would say that Durham Cathedral is good, an excellent example of a of a heritage building that people very much feel belongs to them. Um, no matter how unreligious you are or I mean, how far away you live from Durham Cathedral, if you're from the northeast of England, I imagine that you identify it as identify with it as being important. And definitely anyone that's ever lived in Durham does. 
So here are other views of this government funded and financed and conceived scheme to improve um, the heart of historic Cairo. I think the problem with the historic Cairo World Heritage Site is that most of the government energy has focused on one side of it and the area that's seen as less important has been almost neglected. Um, and I think that comes from the notion that monumental buildings are more important and therefore the area with the most monumental buildings is more important than, than an area which just has kind of 19th century and 18th century residential <coughs> structures. Um, so this is an overview of these two cities. Um, I hope you found it a useful comparison, not only of the differences between Cairo and Durham, which are very striking, but also of some of the similarities, especially in terms of management, that maybe the scale of the challenge is different. Um, maybe the worst thing that one has to worry about in Durham is someone putting a sign on a Lebanese restaurant, while in Cairo, 20 people are building buildings without permission. But, but it's, it's the fact that, I mean, heritage is vulnerable, and, and no matter what policies exist, you still have to be quite vigilant um, protecting a place that is this significant. <coughs>